of all the things I have, I describe in the book, one recurrent theme that goes over and over again is that the more you get into other people's lives and try to understand those lives and have empathy for those lives and have an ability to follow and track those lives over time, the more selfless you get, the less self-centered you become, the more powerful your brain becomes. Welcome to Sound Financial Bites, where we help you with bite-sized pieces of financial and life knowledge to help you design and build a good life. The knowledge that has been shared from stages at conferences, pages of national business magazines, and clients living across America, our host, Paul Adams, now brings directly to you. Welcome to Sound Financial Bites. I'm Paul Adams. It's so good to have you with us today. We know you're out running, you're doing dishes, you're working on your car, or you're out for a walk or driving the office this morning. No matter what you're doing, we're thankful to have you with us today, especially because of our guests today. That's right. I said guests, plural, uh, because we not only have the president of Sound Financial Group, Corey Shepard, with us, uh, but we also have a guest that I'm going to let him introduce. But first, let me just share with you the topic of what we're covering today to really get you the right mindset, if you will, for what we're going to talk about. We always promise that what we're going to help you do with these podcasts is help you design and build a good life. And designing and building a good life oftentimes requires that we take care of certain financial concerns. But then there's a lot of areas of life, a lot of conditions of life we have to care for outside of our finances. Because if all we have is wealth and we haven't taken care of everything else, the wealth won't matter much to us. So today we're talking about aging with the brain in mind. And we're going to talk a little bit about what it takes for you as you age to make sure you don't die after your brain does. We want to make sure it lasts as long as you do. So let me introduce Corey, who's then going to introduce our very special guest today. Corey Shepard, author of Cape Not Required, president of our firm, Sound Financial Group. He's the one that makes sure that like a guided missile, I'm pointed in the right direction every single day. We're so thankful <laughs> for Corey as an organization and anybody who knows him or gets to know him says the exact same thing. Corey, so glad you could be here. Thank you, Paul. Me as well. I'm glad to be able to jump on some more of these, these podcasts. So it's my honor to introduce Dr. John Medina, a developmental molecular biologist. Can't believe he got that out. It means exactly <laughs> the opposite thing that you would think it would mean as far as if you would be entertained by listening to him talk. He's very in, engaging. I've had the opportunity to hear him uh, speak, and I'll, I'll call a little fanboy moment on myself. Dr. Medina is an affiliate professor of bioengineering at the University of Washington School of Medicine, which is important to me for a couple of reasons. One, my wife is now studying there. Two, in 2008 at Seattle Pacific University was the first time I got to see him speak, and I was digging through some of my notes and realized that his book, uh, first book, Brain Rules, was one of the first books I bought as an early adopter on the first generation Kindle. So I've known about Dr. Medina for a long time and excited to have someone local to Seattle here with us. So John, welcome to Sound Financial Bites. Thank you for inviting me. Our pleasure. And I think one thing you everybody's going to notice is you get a chance to listen to John. He is not only entertaining and engaging, though when you get around to looking up his book, you are going to notice he is just as entertaining when he reads the book. But Dr. Medina, here's the first thing that showed up for us. We talk about this idea with our clients that what they need to do is focus not just on you know, their, their money, but that they need to focus on how healthy they are because they need to care about their functional longevity. We say sure. it doesn't matter how long you live. It's really going to matter if they like living that long. Sure. And you talk a little bit about the difference between longevity and lifespan, life expectancy. And that surprised me because I'd never heard the distinction between those. Could we start with you talking first broadly about your books and talking about how the brain works well and then dovetailing into longevity, life expectancy, and what, what that means to us and what we can do with it? Sure, you bet. 
The reason I wrote the book Brain Rules for Aging Well was because of two numbers, Paul. The first number was I'm 61 years old. <laughs> so I have watched as everybody does, you begin to see certain cognitive components begin to decline or change with age and so on. And I've been writing about aging for a long time. I wrote a, uh, one of my first books for Cambridge University Press was called The Clock of Ages, where we're talking about how the body ages. This time I wanted to focus in on the brain. But the second number was this, and I say this in the book, anywhere between 25 and 33% of the variance in life expectancy can be explained by how well you chose your parents. Now, what that means is <laughs> how long you can live <laughs> is directly associated with your genetics. But only 33% of those numbers take that into, into account. So that much is up to your helix. That much is up to your DNA. The rest of it, the majority of it, 75% of it up to, has to concern your lifestyle. So if the first number is that I'm 61, the second number is, well, what about the variance in lifestyle? To understand actually that numbers formally in, from a geroscientific perspective, you're right that we should start with the definition. So let's talk about longevity and lifespan and aging. The uh, longevity is the number of years you could spend on the planet if the conditions for your survival were perfect. It varies from creature to creature. There are uh, bacteria that can live for 400,000 years. In fact, there are some bacteria that probably are live uh, uh, infinite if the conditions are correct. You've got bowhead whales that will only live for 200 years. You've got mayflies that will only live for 24 hours. Longevity is determined by our genetics. So that's a genetic component. When you talk about life expectancy, or sometimes people will use the word lifespan, we use them interchangeably. This is the amount of time you can spend on the planet, given that conditions are not optimal. So there's a strong environmental component to that fixed number. For example, it wasn't until about the 17th century that we could live on average, our lifespan was longer than 35 years. For the vast majority of our time on the planet, we mostly died in our 30s. By the time of the turn of the last century, 19th to the 20th, in the United States, we were now living to 49. And now you can live nearly to 80 years of age if you do things right. So that's lifespan. It's like an accordion. You can move it up and down depending upon environment. The third characteristic is something we call aging, but that actually also has a formal definition. That is the... Uh, uh, Random process of eroding would probably be the best way to say it. It's not genetic at all. It's just subject to repair systems that begin breaking down after a while. So longevity is the amount of time genetically you could live on the planet if things were perfect. Life expectancy is the amount of time you will live on the planet given that things are not always perfect. And aging is the process that kills you. <laughs> so that <laughs> nice depressing note. I'll take your next question. Well, John, can you... so? I would love your your help here because I read your book with lots of things to, that we could do to improve and, and know that lifestyle is part of it. Genetics is part of it. But then I see, you know, George Burns for the older generation smoking cigars every day into his 90s or over Drinking 100. Drinking beefeater. Don't Drinking, forget that. Right. Hugh Hefner living <laughs> potentially one of the most irresponsible lifestyles a man has ever Wildly lived. Wildly irresponsible. <laughs> and I think obviously – they lived to those ages despite doing those things, probably not because sure. they did those things. So genetics probably had something sure. to do with it. So where do we yeah. fall between, you know, what do I actually do when, you know, I'm, what I'm getting you to do is try to, to tell me that I can smoke and drink and eat bad every day and it'll still probably all work out. <laughs> well, thank goodness the statistics don't apply to individuals because right. the vast majority of the time, those things actually hurt you. Smoking really does hurt people. But I can talk in general terms, the biological mechanisms of aging and get at, Corey, perhaps uh, a, a, a tangent to your question. Um, we know that aging, I used to, when I, between my undergraduate and graduate uh, uh, years, I worked at Derigold for about a year where I was the microbiologist. And so I would do... Um, uh, buttercream contents, and I would look for microbes and all kinds of stuff you do in a laboratory. I watched, it was, it was over at Issaquah where the plant was. Mm -hmm. I watched those machines break down on a regular basis. They broke down all the time. So much so is that they actually employed about a dozen engineers. They were the engineering group that did nothing but make sure those machines worked all the time because that dairy was in operation 24 hours a day. I thought to myself, 
if those engineers ever got sick or they all of a sudden just quit, this dairy processing plant would fall to its knees because it's in constant need of repair. And believe it or not, that's a perfect metaphor for how we age and why we might be able to explain George Burns and Hugh Hefner. And I would also argue like people like Mike Wallace, who also smoked mm -hmm. for a great deal of his life and lived till the age of 93. Here it is. As you, your body is metabolically active 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just like the plant is. And just like the plant, it sometimes breaks down. That's a normal process of living on the planet. It's a complex machine. It breaks down all the time. You have repair mechanisms in your body that are built to do nothing but 24 hours a day, seven days a week, constantly repair those systems. Now, as you get older, the damage occurs not just to your body, but also to the repair systems. As long as the repair systems work well, you will, you will live a, a nice life on this planet. But after about age 30, that's the zero point where the amount of damage that you get and the ability to repair it is about equal, after age 30, you begin to repair the damage less well. And the amount of damage begins to increase and your ability to repair that damage decreases. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and I think that if you look at that plant and the breakdowns, there's also certain other things we're doing that intentionally cause the breakdowns. Like we're intentionally oh, yeah. breaking our body each time we go work out at the gym, trying to get that repair and, sure. and build that resilience. Does, does doing that help our body then in later times? Like even if let's say weight is not an issue, you're just one of those people that doesn't gain weight. Yeah. Do we find yeah. that the, the activity of working out and exercising those systems that repair the breakdowns actually extend yeah. into an older age? Well, now you're asking the correct questions about how it is that you can ameliorate the natural deterioration, because the question is not about how do you age well. The question is how to keep the repair systems up and running as much as you can. To just a, a quick uh, parenthetic on uh, Hugh Hefner to close this out, or the uh, <laughs> Mike Wallace or George Burns, mm -hmm. their repair systems are probably excellent, and that's genetic. Mm -hmm. They probably are resistant to... Uh, 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 to damage. And because they're resistant to damage, we actually have a name for this, you guys. We call people that have this welderlies. That's literally their name. Mm -hmm. And they're being actively studied because we're asking questions about what are the genetic repair systems that they keep, uh, that they keep around and is there a way to potentiate that? Well, we do know that there are ways to potentiate or at least to slow down the aging process. Some of them are really unexpected. Can I, do you mind if I give you one? Love it. No, it'd be great. In fact, we, we can give you the whole book because that's kind of what it's all about. <laughs> what if, well, I'll be brief. I know we've only got, what, 15, 20 minutes left. The, uh, um, one of the most unexpected is uh, if you want to age beautifully, and that's the way I'm going to say this, you need to have lots of friends. You need to have what's called a socially integrated, an active socially integrated network. That means you have to be visiting your family all the time, and that means you have to be interacting with your friends all the time. Uh, uh, 1,000, in fact, I think it was about 1,100 seniors were measured over about a 12-year period, and they found that the highest socializing group had a rate of cognitive decline in their elder years that was 70% less than people that didn't have any friends or chose not to interact with their friends. They also found that those guys, those men and women that were socializing the most, that were highly integrated, had a memory decline that was half that of the non-socializers. So one of the most important things you can say to a group of people uh, that want to arrest that er eroding repair system uh, damage that's occurring is to have lots of friends. And if you don't know how to do that, go out and find some books that will allow you to become socially competent. It is quite clear in the literature that if aging really begins at age 30 and you're at your peak and begin to decline after age 30, you should start making friends and learning how to keep them and repairing things with your family if your family re relationships are broken at around age 30 and then you sustain them all your life if you really want to capture that 70 percent uh, loss of, uh, of cognitive decline so that's one easy thing to do here's another one john can i we jump in know. on something that you just reminded me of from your book that i just yeah. absolutely loved which is 
talking about how social interaction and even physical touch helps yeah. the brain in the, in the elderly. It, it just yeah. like hit me like a, a ton of bricks because I realized I could go visit my grandma more at the retirement sure. home. Uh, as, a, as a culture, we tend to push our elderly at the edge into isolation, which is exactly the opposite thing that is be- beneficial for us to age well. So right. those of us who are younger and still maybe pushing some of those buttons, probably yeah. it's in our own self-interest to start treating that elder generation well, because the one behind us is going to learn how to treat us <laughs> when we get there. And watching it with my yeah. own father at 88 years old, you outlive yeah. all of your network. So if you're not yeah. adept at rebuilding network, he has outlived. My dad is one of the friendliest people you'd ever meet one of the most yeah. well-connected in every city we've ever lived in, never met wow. a stranger, and it doesn't matter now because they all die, All of them have died before him. And now he's well, got me and my core family and you know his wife, my mom. That's, that's <laughs> it because he just doesn't, he doesn't have the capacity to build the network that died off as he continued to live. It's extraordinary how, you know, when I was writing this book uh, and doing some of the research just kind of in the field work, uh, by going and visiting uh, nursing homes and, and the like. Um, it's extraordinary how invisibly we treat elderly mm-hmm. people. They, they become invisible. Uh, they, you go to a nursing home, they may not smell right. You may think they're fragile. Maybe they're in a wheelchair. So you're right, Corey. We stop touching them. And as a result of that, because they don't have, and touch is an extraordinarily important component of mental health, particularly with depression and and anxiety disorders, something we call affective disorders. But if you can touch a senior and and have regular non-exploitive touching, so there's lots of hugs and Mm -hmm. lots of affirmations and attaboys and whatnot, you actually can improve their mental health. Wow. And and just a moment here, I want to ask you two really important points, but I'm going to have to take a quick break to hear from Corey at Sound Financial Group. So as soon as we get back from that, I want to make sure that I we ask you about how we're the only species capable of living past its prime and mindfulness and what that does for us in attentional switching. But before we go to break, let me remind everybody that John's organization has prepared a really special surprise for all of you. And what you can do if you want to get a hold of that is go to aging dot sfgwa.com. It's going to be in the show notes. You can find it if you go to our website for the episode or pull it up in the, the description here in, on your iPhone or if you're listening to us on Switcher. Once again, aging.sfgwa.com. We're going to be right back. At Sound Financial Group, we are committed to continuing to bring you Sound Financial Bites. Hello, my name is Corey Shepard, president of Sound Financial Group. If you are finding value in these weekly podcasts and they are making a difference in the way you think about money, then think about what kind of a difference could be made if you engaged one of our advisors to help you look at your personal finances. So what would the next step be? Send an email to info at sfgwa.com with philosophy in the subject line, and we will coordinate with you to have a conversation with Paul myself, or one of our other advisors to share with you our philosophy of money. No one is going to close you on that call. No one is going to make you an offer to become a client. The only thing we allow our advisors to do in that call is teach. And the only thing we allow you to do is ask for an application. While we don't accept everyone who applies to work with us, we are committed that any Sound Financial Bites listener who wants to go deeper has the chance to expand their thinking and walk away with new education and resources around money. So even if we find out we aren't right to work together, our team will absolutely take care of you in that call and make sure that you have access to resources that might be of help to you. All right. Welcome back, John. I think I may have cut you off there slightly mid-thought, and I don't want to do that. And we'll but we'll ask you some of these other topics as we come up. I'm going to let you roll with your knowledge on where you left us off. Okay. Well, we had just finished talking about the power of touch. But what I think is most interesting is that, uh, and this has actually been measured, people ask the question, because as we'll see also, exercise, physical exercise also improves the brain. It improves something we call executive function. And you need to get out there when you're exercising to uh, uh, um uh, in a very particular way with the social interaction, was there a human activity that combined touch, 
social interaction and physical exercise all in one. Because if you could do all of the one activity and hit all three buttons, you might actually see changes in cognition and maybe even in motor skill. There is one, you guys. It's dancing. Mm. If you teach, now this can't be just the dance where you just sit there and wiggle in front of each other, okay? This is going to be dancing. But like <laughs> so, square dancing that I did in middle school in gym class yeah, and all the boys didn't want to touch trot. the girls. Yeah. What they called uh, ballroom dancing? Is that what that's called? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you do that kind of stuff where you are, what dancing is, particularly in elderly populations, first of all, you touch each other, okay? Even if it's just a, ritual, uh, 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 a ritualized touch, it's still a touch. Second, you're exercising. So you're actually uh, moving around the ballroom, you're cutting the rug, whatever you're doing. And the third thing is that you have a, a social interaction because dancing is social. And so the question was asked was, if you got a bunch of sedentary seniors to start dancing, could you change their brains? Could you change their minds? Could you change their bodies? First up, our bodies. The first thing that happens if you get somebody regularly dancing, and it only takes about a month to do this, you can get posture and balance scores to improve by 25%. No kidding. Whoa. You reduce the number of falls, which is catastrophic in yes. elderly populations, by 37% if they're dancing. And the effect sizes, which are measures of correlation, were almost seven times greater for positive cognitive function in what we call executive function with exercisers than with couch potatoes. Now, executive function is, a, is an important concept here, so you, you won't mind if I just define it very quickly. Um, it has two components. One of them is cognitive control. If you've got strong executive function, you have the ability to take a multiple series of variables and quickly make it into a heuristic, like a hierarchical heuristic. So people that have exec- good executive function are often really good at math because that's what math does. The second part of executive function is impulse control. If, you, if somebody yells at you and you want to punch them in the nose, but you've decided that it's not a good idea to punch them in the nose, the reason why you have edited that impulse is because you have impulse control. So exercise has the ability to control two very powerful behaviors in anybody's brain, including a senior's brain. And so one of the recommendations I have in the book, you guys, sounds really weird, but it's absolutely the case. Teach them to dance. Even Mm. if they can barely stand for three songs, that's necessary and sufficient. Get them up and running and you can get all three at once. And that was where I was going with that thought. So if you would, I, I had a unique experience, which is what I thought of when going through your book. And that was, I was at uh, Yellowstone. And they have an exhibit at the west entrance of Yellowstone where you can see like grizzly bears because they're pretty hard to see in the wild and they eat you. So it's much better to take your small children to an exhibit to watch them than it is to try to find these grizzly bears in the wild. So Keeps litigation to, to a minimum. You know? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and what we found was they had the, a wolf exhibit also. And uh-huh. we asked, I said, how long do these wolves tend to live? And they said, oh, they, you know, they can live a really long time. And I don't remember exactly, but it's like 18 to 22 years that they'll uh-huh. live yeah. there. And I was like, really? That yeah. is amazing. They say, yeah, in the wild, they'll make it like three to five years max. Yeah. Sure. And sure. I remember thinking of that when you mentioned in the book that we're the only species that in our environment live way past our prime. And that's where a lot of our aging issues come from is that we are living past the point by which nature would care about us because we're beyond the general age of maximum procreation. Yeah. 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 Our five to six years of the wolf is age 30 for us. After age 30, it's genetic free fall and we should be dead. It's long enough to have kids and then long enough to have our kids have kids. And then there's no selective pressure on us. The repair systems begin to go offline and off you go. But we have a very interesting way to solve that in that we had a prefrontal cortex and an ability to do symbolic reasoning and a whole bunch of other things, including cooperation. In fact, if you think about it for a second, we are the only species that can really do this in spades. We can extend the length of our arm not by pulling on our arm and extending its length, but by throwing a rock. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The ability to take our physical environment and then utilize our brain to add and augment that environment. We can even double our biomass, Paul, not by doubling our biomass, waiting millions of years for evolution to do it. 
We learned to do it by just waiting a few hundred thousand years and changing a few neurons in our brain to create the concept of ally, social interaction, mm -hmm. where if we could coordinate our, active, uh, our activity with our buddy, we would actually double our biomass without doubling our biomass. The effect on the wow. planet would be exactly the same. Yes. And that's the solution that we tried. So when we get past age 30, and we should be dead by that time, because we can now extend the length of our arm and create the concept of ally and do experiments and become scientists, we can have all kinds of things that we can do, which extends our lifespan in such fashion that it might actually equal our longevity. Does that make sense? Mm. Yes. Yes. Because but remember, I longevity want... is the amount of time you could spend on the planet yes. if the conditions were correct. And lifespan is the amount of, of time you do spend on the planet because conditions aren't correct. But if you could change that last clause and make the conditions correct artificially, eh, you can break it up to 122. And, and before I hand it back to Corey, going back to something I mentioned earlier about the idea of what I was saying was functional lifespan, then I'm using the wrong term. It needs to be functional. What, what is the right term? Well, well, you could say probably the best one would be functional survival <laughs> <laughs> and stay away from the lifespan is, is, is a number of years. Yes. So if you want to have so you're asking for the number of years that are wonderful, you could say it that way. And, but, and, uh, and longevity is also a number. It's also a number of years. The, uh, the variable that toggles them is whether or not you have the optimal environment. Does that so make sense? Life, yes, lifespan yeah. is the way that holds it properly. Longevity was the way I was holding it before. So that is that is great. That is great. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, so terrific. Okay, you get an A. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> John. Mindfulness is having its moment in pop culture right now. Yes, it it's all over, and uh, you know I've been listening to some of those podcasts and reading research, and you know I've started a, a meditation practice, uh -huh. trying to be mindful in the living the moment. And then you give us a quote in your book from Norman Lear, famous uh, oh, TV yeah. producer, <laughs> saying, yeah. "You know the secret to his long." I think he was he was into his nineties. The yes. stretching, he's doing yoga alive. on Dr. Oz. Oh, he's still alive. Great. Yeah, he's still alive. Um, better. Yeah. And, uh, and I love what you said about the secret being the two words over and next. Uh, and the hammock, <laughs> the hammock between the two is yeah. living in the moment. It was just so beautiful. Powerful. And the idea yeah. came to me that, could you talk a little bit about our brain? Uh, the way I thought about it is it's like a computer or a VCR that playing it a certain way actually makes it work better longer. That's such an yeah. amazing phenomenon. Can you tell us how that sure. contributes to aging well? You bet. Well, what I think Norman is really getting at is something that is deeply empirical in the literature. We have to be careful with this, though, because as you said, Corey, mindfulness has gotten out into pop psychology land. Mm -hmm. And I don't fault Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz or any of the other folks that are uh, doing this stuff. Uh, but they're not necessarily research scientists. And so I would argue that you should go to John Kabat-Zinn and people like David Cresswell, who are actually doing a lot of great neurological work. There's even a, uh, not to disparage things, but I've actually seen a book called Mindfulness for Dogs. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'm thinking, what are you guys smoking? Yeah. Because mindfulness, if you do it correctly, if you do the John Kabat-Zinn eight-week protocol, that's an actual research instrument you can buy on Amazon, you see unbelievable changes in the brain because of the ability to do what Norman Lear is doing, and that is focus on the present. We know that mindful seniors have way few, uh, fewer infectious diseases, uh, uh, and uh, they also have better cardiovascular health. In fact, I think there's, it's an 80%, 86% increase in improvement from markers in, of cardiovascular health. It's ridiculous wow. how healthy they become. They show a 30% improvement in attentional states all because they practice the John Kabat-Zinn protocols of mindfulness. Now, mindfulness has two gadgets associated with it. The first one is that it actually asks you if you do the eight-week protocol. And Corey, it sounds like you do. Is that correct? I haven't done John Kabat-Zinn, but I'm about to 
because I'm already oh, meditating anyway, so I might as well and, follow the research. And I think I'm about to, given you just said it. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I tell you what, I, I know that this is supposed to be Hawk in my book, but I've got a better one for this one. And it's, 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 it's done by Teasdale, T-E-A-S-D-A-L-E, and it's called The Mindful Way. And it actually describes the eight-week research instrument. And it's, it's a workbook. You can actually go through it. I recommend you get that and follow mm. it. What you do, what happens is that you do strange things like, for some reason, <laughs> they focus on raisins. So they want you to focus on a raisin. What's interesting about mindfulness is that it's actually a very aggressive form of meditation. It's not asking you to clear your mind at all. Not at all. It's actually asking you to focus your mind on a very specific thing. So you're going to look at that raisin for a little while and you stare at it and you get bored with it and then your mind wanders and then you come back. What's really fun about mindfulness is that it will tell you, focus on the raisin. But you know what? Mindfulness also says, if you stray away from the raisin, that's okay. You're a busy guy. You just come on back to that raisin as soon as you can. <laughs> it is such a gentle way of calling you to quit thinking about the stuff that bugs you. And we actually think that's the secret sauce because it's asking you to focus on a raisin and it's having you do deep breathing exercises while you're focusing on the raisin, which is why it can feel like meditation, though it is not meditation. The, uh, um, and it will also ask you to do something called a body scan. So for 15, 20 seconds, you're going to focus on your forehead. And then when that's done, you're going to focus on your earlobe all the while you're breathing. And mindfulness will say to you gently, I, if you fo stop focusing on your earlobe for a second, that's okay. Come on back. Come on back and focus on that earlobe as soon as you're ready and we'll continue. The present, the present, the present. So powerful is this. I do it in my own life. I remember this actually happened. It was hysterical. The, uh, because if there's anything that really pisses me off, it's going to be with, if I'm driving and somebody cuts me off, particularly mm -hmm. nowadays with Seattle being as so crowded as it is on the freeways. And that, this actually happened. So uh, somebody cut me off and I was about ready to get really angry, you guys. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> a raisin appeared in my mind. <laughs> that is good. I'm not kidding. And my, my uh, breath started to calm down and I started to just focus on my earlobe. And I thought to myself, oh man, this really works. Because what it did is it calmed me right down and I could forgive the guy who was in front of me and I, and I relaxed way back and I could feel those markers of cardiovascular health getting their 86% boost. Yes. And um, I think most importantly is that it, even in senior populations, it can give you a change in your ability to attend to stimuli because you're learning to focus on one thing rather than being fragmented in your distraction. And I actually think that's the secret sauce. But to tell you, this works. This is done in the peer review. It's been done with randomized blinded trials. John is terrific at what he's done. Uh, Cresswell is terrific. He's done the neuroscience. He's at uh, University of Pittsburgh uh, to, to show this mindfulness. We're now in real science. We are no longer in what I'll just call la-la land for meditation. Well, then we will add that to the show notes so that people can go and, and link, follow to that along with your book. Uh, if Excellent. I can... It, step away for a moment from what people hold in their mind and shift to what people put in their mouth is one of the last two sure. questions I have for you today. Okay. If you look at right now, the, I would say in vogue and certainly has been a part of my life and has at least now it could be placebo. A lot of people don't know this placebo is Latin for it works anyway. So I understand <laughs> that, that this could be placebo. It frustrates the heck out of us who are trying to do experiments beyond yeah, it. I'm sure. <laughs> So if for, for me, what I noticed was uh, following some of the protocols that, uh, you know, some of the like biohackers that are out there talk about things yeah. like Dave Asprey, Tim Ferriss, the idea of a yeah. relatively yeah. Uh, unprocessed diet with a ton of fat coming into the body and the, yeah. the ability to, you know, take out things like gluten, like some of the things that otherwise we, certain types of grains that really affect people poorly, have them in yeah. brain fog. Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts generally about that, you know, high fat, the carbs to take in, making sure they're natural carbs and what that does for yeah. or against the brain? Well, I do have to tell you, you're going to run right into my skeptical grump factor. <laughs> fair fair <laughs> enough. For the longest time, 
Just so it doesn't mess I up my placebo do... factor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if it works for you, you know, raisins I hear are really good for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, um, the reason why, and this is the first time I've written, I think this is book number 12, and I've been publishing and been a researcher since not, uh, active in the active field since 1988. You're getting this is it. the first time in my professional life I ever put in a book a nutrition data point. Mm. And the reason why is that I have been highly skeptical. So talk about mythologies that occur. Highly skeptical about applying anything in the nutrition scientists to, uh, sciences to the world of the cognitive neurosciences. And the reason why is that it is woefully underfunded. I believe deeply that nutrition research it can be extraordinarily valuable. But if you just look at the chemicals in, say, a glass of wine, there's probably 120, 130 different chemicals in there. We don't know what a lot of them are, actually. So when you're drinking and eating complex, uh, almost anything, um, you are eating something that has uncontrolled variables. More importantly, your metabolic profile is going to be different than mine. Everybody's going to squeeze out mm -hmm. different amounts of energy from their carbohydrates. Everybody's going to have, some people are going to have allergies, as you suggest, from the gluten. Other people are not going to have those allergies, which is going to be energy defeating. There's so many variables if you, in one person that if you have them, that one person eat a complex piece of food, you have so many things you're not controlling anymore that it's no longer science. It wasn't until about, oh, I don't know, maybe five years ago that I had to have that come to a screeching halt because I read in the New England Journal of Medicine a paper that changed my mind. <laughs> They, in it, they describe an experiment. It was done primarily, uh, uh, it was done a little bit in the United States, but mostly it was done in Spain and places in Italy, where people were looking at Greek, Italian, and Spanish cuisines and mm -hmm. found a diet that actually changed people's brains when they ate that diet. It's called the Predimed diet, and you would know it better as, in its more famous term, the Mediterranean diet. Yes. The Mediterranean diet has got science underneath it. In it, you're eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. That's for sure. You're, if you're going to have some protein, it's going to need to be white meat, primarily white fish or white meat chicken. You're going to have nuts. And if you're going to have oil, and you can have oil, in fact, you can have a lot of oil, make sure that it is olive oil. When you do that, you see benefits almost that almost defy description in such fashion that other people have done variations on it and have begun to uh, move it down. Martha Claire Morris created something called the Mind Diet, which is including berries in there as well as whole grains, dramatically lowers the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. A, a Mediterranean diet will actually change your short-term memory. And uh, for me to say that sentence, it's funny even as I'm even as I'm hearing myself say it. Um, Corey and Paul, because I, it is now real science. So for the first time, and I include that in the book and put that there to answer your question, what should you put in your mouth? You should put in your mouth any everybody in Southern Greece puts in their mouth because that stuff is going to change your brain. Got it. Okay, that's great. That is and nothing great. else that we know of does. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Wow. <laughs> now, let if I may, so. Yeah. Uh, I, which I got to tell you, The Brain Rules for Aging Well, your most recent book is, as people are listening here and they may go, oh, there's a couple interesting tidbits. I think what people could do is tilt toward, oh, I don't need to read this because I'm only 40 or I'm only 35. And I just want to tell yeah. everybody in our audience, get this book and read it. This book is, it, here's the thing, there's nobody listening, I don't think, who's like, my real intention is, I'm going to die by about 57. I'm out. They're just not going to do that. In fact, we don't have a single client we've talked to that wants to even arrive at age 65 unhealthy. And we constantly remind people, and if you're new to our podcast, let me repeat it again. If you and your spouse are both healthy at age 65, the biggest problem you're going to have is that mortality tables tell us this. You are not going to pass. The second of you will not pass until age 93 as a 50% mortality, which means half, that's not an end point, that's midway, half will live longer. So yeah, yeah. This, this idea of caring for your brain needs to start back when you're 35, 40, 45, 50, like if you, wherever you are on the timeline right now, this is a book to pick up and a book to read. 
But if I can, as a final thought from you, Dr. Medina, can you tell us what is it that from your perspective, somebody picks up the book, they're going to read it. One, is there a chapter you'd have them open to first, or do you think read it from beginning to end? And what I would also say is, is there one or two things that people should leave the podcast today saying, I can do something with this today to help me design and build a good life? Sure. Well, one area we didn't touch on, there are two answers to that question, and one we haven't touched on, so let me get to it quickly. And that is, you're going to need to keep your brain active. If you live to 65 and you're a female, you can expect to live another 24 years. Do you know that? You have to get to 65 to get it, but you'll live to almost age 90. So what are you going to do at 90? You can keep your brain active and healthy if you're constantly engaged in it. So you need to learn a foreign language. You need to learn how to play a new musical instrument. There's even data that suggests you need to regularly get in arguments with people you don't agree with. Don't no check. It's called, check. It's called productive no engagement. <laughs> <laughs> you can increase what's called episodic memory almost 600%. I just said 600%, you guys. Wow. That is, 600%. well, by the way, that's why as a generally conservative person and politically as well, I'm one of the people, smaller government, all that. Generally speaking, yeah. that's why I live in Seattle. It's going to help me live yeah. longer and help my episodic Perfect. memory. Paul, you have no problem yeah. being a healthy elderly woman is what I'm hearing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's absolutely the case, though. If you are uh, your standard issue left of center Seattleite, you need to listen to Rush Limbaugh. You totally do. And if you're a, a, a small government uh, tax cuts for everybody uh, conservative, you need to regularly listen to Rachel Maddow. The productive engagement where you disagree with them and you have to get your reasons why you disagree with them is secret sauce for the brain. That we didn't cover. The other ones we did, but it's, it's the first of the two uh, recommendations I would make. Which Number one, keep your that brain active. That is gold. That, like, no question, John, absolute, not only gold, I got to say, for the sake of cognition and a tool anybody could use because anybody could subscribe to an opposing thoughts podcast. Sure. So that is, sure. that is gold. But this, the second piece is, and I don't ever get into this like really societal, cultural, but how much yeah. that would do for the polarization that just generally exists. If people yeah. realize that not just hanging out with people of their own way of thinking, but actively engaging in yeah. discourse with other people they disagree with would actually extend their life and they could spend a longer that? time disagreeing with those people <laughs> and, and voting against their agenda. <laughs> and changing their ability to remember the engagement. Yes, yes. <laughs> Especially as they get older. What a great way to, to break out of your silos, isn't it? If you wanted yes. to really get at political polarization here, you would follow the great flag of brain science behind it. That's not an opinion, Paul that you should do this. Yes. That's so good. Yeah. We cut you off with, you were going somewhere. Yeah, Disagreement was only part, going to one, part two. Sure. The part two was, oh, sure. You bet. If part one is keeping your mind active, which we didn't talk all about, part two is this. Keep your heart active. Of all the things I, have, I describe in the book, one recurrent theme that goes over and over again is that the more you get into other people's lives, and try to understand those lives and have empathy for those lives and have an ability to follow and track those lives over time, the more selfless you get, the less self-centered you become, the more powerful your brain becomes. No kidding. The ability for you to get outside of your own experience means you're no longer focusing on your own aches and pains. You're no longer sitting there at night ruminating on all the, all the people that did you wrong in your long life. You're no longer focusing on the kinds of things that can slip you into a depression and an anxiety because you're too busy being concerned about other people. You will see this in this book over and over again. It's in socialization. It's also when we're talking about physical exercise, where even when we're talking about improving your mind and cognitions for mean reaction times, the, more, uh, the less self-centered you become the more willing you are to get outside of your own experience and get into somebody else's life. And here's an important point. Be kind with what you see. The better your brain will transit through those 24 years you females have who live past age 65. And, and, and something that for me as not being 
of those advanced years yet. Yeah. The thing that I hear in that is I've, I've had a chance to do uh, uh, seal fit 20 X down in Southern California with the, uh-huh. where a bunch of Navy seals beat you in the ground for 12 hours. Mm-hmm. And one of the things they talk <laughs> about is that you want, if you feel like you can't go anymore, if you yeah. feel like you're totally destroyed, like your body is going to break down, like you are going to collapse, what to yeah. do is look to somebody to your right or left and encourage yeah. them or figure out how you can help them. And that exactly. you know, and I felt that like there was a point where we're moving these sandbags. They told us we had to go get them in the water and put them in a backpack. Yeah. And I was carrying like three of these sandbags already, which are wet. Yeah. Oh, and, oh my God. And, they, and I, I, they told you to buy a really great rucksack, which I did, but they didn't <laughs> let you use those. They made you use these rucksacks that were broken down that I swear they used piano wire for the straps digging into my shoulders. And I felt like I couldn't go up this hill anymore. Looked at the guy you next to me. did this voluntarily. I did it voluntarily and paid for it. And I looked at the guy next to me and I said, let me take your bag. I can help you. And I felt a difference wow. in the way I was able to engage in the moment because sure. I got out of my suffering and took care exactly. of somebody else. And they talk about that yeah. in the special operations forces all the time. That's, that is wonderful. Yeah. John, thank you so much for being here today. I, oh. I'm, I must say that if somebody is walking through a bookstore and has, does anybody do that now? I think there's still bookstores. Yes. So if, <laughs> if somebody, the browser. Ha, yeah, yeah, coming across when the browser. When their router works. Yeah. yeah, that's right. If you, <laughs> if you at all doubt like the value of this book, you know what I would have you do? Start the book, read the last chapter. The claims are outrageous. And you really review a lot of the claims at the end. And mm-hmm. I guarantee anybody listening right now, if they go back and read the last chapter, the, you will be compelled to go back and read the rest of the book so you actually understand what Dr. Medina is teaching us and the difference it could make in your life and probably the difference you could make in the lives of the people that you care about, young and old, by simply sharing with them some of what you learned. So, Dr. Medina, this, this book has been a gift to Corey and I. Very much uh, so. And, and for a decade, Corey's been following you. So it's just <laughs> super <laughs> exciting. Oh, you have, Corey. <laughs> yeah, not, not, not in too weird of a way. Not continuously. Let's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like your good deep dish pizza, okay? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a treat to have you. I would encourage everybody, if you want to get the, the surprise that his team has put together for us, you can go to aging.sfgwa.com. It's super generous for uh, you know Dr. Medina's team to just put that together, give it to all of you. And we just hope that the time we've spent together today has been a contribution to you being able to design and build a good life. That's a wonderful way to end an interview. I appreciate your kind words. I want to acknowledge you for taking the time to tune in to Sound Financial Bites. You stopped long enough in your busy day to reflect on your finances and your future to help you design and build a good life. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. If you have a topic you would like to hear us discuss, please send us a note on Facebook, LinkedIn, soundfinancialbites.com, or email us at info at sfgwa.com. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to any resources that were covered in each episode. For our full disclosure, please check the description of this episode, the description of this podcast series, or you can visit our website. Make it a great day.